Hello, my name is Danae Doris and I am the project manager for the American Clearinghouse on Educational Facilities. I would like to thank you for listening to our podcast today entitled Renovation versus Replacement of Older and Historic Schools. ASEP is the Educational Facilities Clearinghouse funded by the United States Department of Education, established to provide technical assistance, training, and resources to public early childhood schools, K-12 schools, and institutions of higher education. ASEF provides resources on facility planning, design, financing, construction, improvement, operation, and maintenance. We invite you to follow ASEF online at acefacilities.org and also encourage you to join the network of professionals already following the educational facilities discussions on Facebook, Twitter, and Blogger. Without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce our presenter for today's podcast, Mr. Royce Yader. Mr. Yader serves as a foundation director where he assists with project development and planning. Often, he serves as a historic preservation consultant. Mr. Yader has published prolifically and received numerous awards for his preservation efforts. Again, it is my honor to present to you Mr. Royce Yader. Thank you, Mr. Yader, for sharing your experiences and expertise with our audience today. Thank you, Dr. Doris, for that introduction. When school districts want to improve their facilities, they often face an immediate question. Is it better to renovate the schools we have, or should they be replaced? This podcast will help school administrators understand the process by which they can answer that question. Historic preservationists believe, and there's a growing body of evidence, that older and historic schools can often be renovated at no more and often less cost than new schools when all the costs are figured into the equation. This is because older schools were often built very well in the late 19th and early 20th centuries as civic monuments and thus offer solid value in their basic form and structure. Older and historic schools also often have amenities and architectural character unaffordable in replacement schools today. Some schools, however, were built cheaply to handle sudden booms in student population and have now thoroughly expended their useful life. The process outlined here is intended to yield an objective analysis of the choice between renovation and replacement. There is no universal answer. Each school must be evaluated individually because the viability of renovation can also depend upon the level of maintenance the building has received through the years. School administrators should first assemble an unbiased professional team to help them undertake the process. The entire team should have experience with both renovation and new construction and be committed to objective analysis. Such teams are usually led by a seasoned architect and include school programmers and planners, plus structural, civil, electrical, and mechanical engineers, along with cost estimators. Once the team is assembled, the first step is the compilation of an architectural program. An outline of the school's grade structure and curriculum, along with its pedagogical strategies as established in a separate district-wide educational plan. School planners and programmers, as well as some experienced architects, are capable of leading discussions of stakeholders to prepare that outline, and then translate it into a list of functions and rooms, each quantified with the square footage required for that activity. An architectural program also includes a chart illustrating the ideal adjacencies. This is not a floor plan, but rather a relational matrix or an abstract diagram. ACEF offers other podcasts on architectural programming, so I will not dwell on the mechanics of that process here. The preparation of an architectural program is not specific to either school renovation or a new school. It is a necessary first step for either. So preparing it first provides an ideal objective standard from which the feasibility of a school renovation can be measured and a new school could be designed. The goal is to create the best and highest value school for the lowest cost. While the architectural program is being assembled, the professional team can prepare an assessment of the current school, its configuration, construction, materials, and systems, with two objectives. First, to become thoroughly familiar with how it is built and identify flexibilities and limitations for reconfiguration. Second, to understand what elements of the building retain useful value and to identify elements which will need to be repaired or replaced. This is called a condition assessment and is commonly undertaken in seven categories, each analyzed by appropriate technical specialists of the team. The seven categories are site, structure, envelope, interiors, mechanical systems, electrical systems, codes and security. Let's take a brief look at each of these. The first category determines the sufficiency of the site. 
The size of a site needed for any given school can vary significantly based on educational goals, neighborhood context, transportation systems, neighboring recreational amenities, and other local factors. The team should avoid arbitrary or generalized standards, such as the old dictum that a high school requires 30 acres plus one acre for every 100 students, and instead apply creative thinking to determine if a school can meet its programmatic needs on the available site. Remember that abandonment of a school is an expensive proposition requiring acquisition of land and often the development of wholly new utility infrastructures. The site evaluation also focuses on the traffic patterns that support school functions and then looks closely at the condition of civil engineering systems, drainage patterns, sewer, water services, curb and gutter, paving, landscaping, etc. The second category, the structure of a building, is like our bones. It is what holds us up. The structure of a building commonly comprises 15 to 25 percent of its cost, so a sound structural system represents real value. On the other hand, failures or inflexibilities of a structural system can be the most expensive to remedy. The team will look for any evidence of structural failure, often in the form of cracks. But the presence of a few cracks alone should not be seen as scary. Professionals know which kind of cracking is a common and necessary derivative of expansion and contraction of the building, which represents something more serious. The team will also identify which walls are load-bearing and which are just partitions. They will identify column and beam systems and materials of which they are comprised and their flexibility for modification. Structural engineers will also identify clear spans where there's an opportunity to house larger functions and assembly spaces. The third category, the envelope, is essentially the skin of a building and the related components that keep the elements out and create a temperate environment within. It usually comprises about 20 to 30 percent of a building's cost. So again, if it is in good condition, it can represent real value. Building envelopes, however, require maintenance, roof repair, occasional replacement, masonry pointing, window and door repair, weather stripping, etc. Thus, the condition and the level of maintenance over the life of building can prove critical to the viability of renovation. On the other hand, mold, a byproduct of poor maintenance, can be remediated once the source of moisture penetration has been repaired. Professional assessment of each of a building's envelope components will also identify the corrective action for any deficiencies. Older and historic schools are often defined by their expansive windows, since natural light was and still is critical to the learning process. Proper repair of glazing systems, a replacement with appropriate units that maintain the architectural character of the building, is important. Sadly, too many original windows were replaced in our schools in the 1970s by cheap metal sash that purported to be more energy efficient, but in fact to perform poorly and have proven to have short lifespan. I have found that original wood windows, when still present, can often be rehabilitated and made energy efficient at less cost than quality replacement units. The interiors of older schools were built with plaster and tile interior walls, with terrazzo or hardwood floors, and with hardwood trim, all intended to be durable and maintainable under intense use. Older schools, too, were often graced with architectural features like decorative plaster work, handsome water fountains, and classical detailing. In many cases, rather than maintain these finishes, school districts have covered them up with inexpensive paneling, carpeting, suspended ceilings. Because interior finishes represent 15 to 25 percent of a building's cost, the removal of such misguided improvements and restoration of original finishes may be less expensive than starting from scratch in new construction. The team will analyze the condition of all finishes and assess the feasibility of restoring the value of original interior material. The next category, mechanic equipment, including heating, ventilating, air conditioning, plumbing systems, must be inspected to determine the remaining operating life of each component the boilers, distribution piping, fans and ductwork, condensers and chillers. These systems have worked hard for years on end and their lifespan is finite, so it is not uncommon that original mechanical equipment, if still operating, has outlived its usefulness. But even if such systems must be totally replaced with more modern systems, the 20 to 25 percent of the value of a building they represent will be no more expensive in a renovation than a new construction, and their new service life will be the same too. And schools built before 1950 which rarely had ventilation systems, were built with high ceilings and plenty of interstitial space that today allows the integration of modern distribution networks. The team will also analyze the electrical service capacity, including lighting, communications and signals, controls and alarms, and the condition of all related equipment. Again, older schools have sufficient interstitial space through which to route new systems as necessary, and the cost of that work, usually 10 to 15 percent of a building, will be no more expensive than a comparable new construction. 
As with mechanical equipment, it is not unusual some components and subsystems have been upgraded through the years, so any remaining useful life will constitute real value. Code compliance is critical when the health and safety of children is at stake. Four kinds of codes apply, each with slightly different enforcement mechanisms and all which design professionals know well. Fire codes focus primarily on life safety, and in most states, compliance can be mandated at any time by fire marshals. On the other hand, existing buildings are grandfathered under building codes, which are enforced by building officials only when a building permit is required for new work. Handicapped accessibility is a civil right enforced largely through the threat of litigation, and codes dealing with food management and hazardous substances like lead, asbestos, and molds are enforced by a variety of health and environmental agencies. Remember that any hazardous materials must be abated whether the building is renovated or demolished. The professional design team will evaluate the existing building relative to all of these and identify issues which must be addressed in a renovation and their related costs. Another concern related to codes is safety and security. Schools today must manage and monitor access while concurrently allowing easy exit in an emergency or fire. Schools designed before these concerns arose were once viewed as difficult to secure, but today computer-controlled smart hardware can enable zoned access and lockdown on schedule or in an instant without compromising exiting requirements in a fire. These systems are increasingly in common use in both renovated older schools and in brand new ones. So having completed both the architectural program as I spoke of at the beginning and analyzed the seven components during the condition assessment, the team will now be ready to put the two pieces together and begin comparative analysis of both renovation and new construction options. Because they know now the building's strengths and weaknesses, they can analyze the ways and places that the current school fails to meet its new programmatic goals, and then explore the ways functions could be relocated, reorganized, refitted to serve the new educational objectives outlined in the architectural program. This is a test of educational sufficiency, but applied with a degree of creativity. Sometimes it is a matter of restoring rooms to the original function that have been altered over the years. In other cases, functions included in the new program, such as a counseling center, security station, or adequate female athletic facilities may never have existed at the time of original construction, and another space may need to be adapted to that use, or sometimes a modest addition is necessary to meet those needs. But it may also be true that past additions, made to solve some immediate problem without holistic thought, muddled the floor plan. Misguided past editions also often employed different floor-to-floor heights, generating many stairs that make modern accessibility difficult. It always amazed me over my 40 years of practice how often we found that by simply removing poorly conceived additions and sometimes re-expanding more thoughtfully and sensitively, an older school could again meet modern educational expectations. This process of designing improvements to an existing school is kind of like solving a crossword puzzle that someone else started. It requires reanalysis of all earlier decisions, followed by creative trial and error explorations until it all fits together. Such creative problem solving is not unlike designing a new school from scratch, except it takes a little longer to rethink past judgments and deal with a few more complicating issues. But if done right, it can yield extraordinary results, blending the best of the past with today's needs to create a 21st century school with traditional character. When the team has completed a creative solution to the renovation puzzle, they will involve their cost estimator to prepare a statement of probable cost. This cost of renovation does not lend itself to industry-wide norms, since there are too many variables. So each school must be taken through this process and priced on the work necessary to bring that particular school to parity with a newly designed school. To draw the comparison, the team may concurrently prepare a schematic design for a new school, or at least develop a conceptual plan that can be priced in a similar manner. Be aware, though, that the cost of a new school is relatively easy to calculate based on square footage norms and quantification of the architectural program at published industry cost per square foot norms. Either way, both plans should be submitted to a value analysis by school officials, elected leaders, and other stakeholders. If the cost of a new school is significantly less than the cost of renovation, the decision may seem easy. Although, do not then forget to consider the cost of disposing of the old school and other hidden costs that are inherent in new construction, particularly if a new site is needed. Conversely, if renovation is clearly the better value, the path forward must then consider what accommodations must be made to continue classes while that work occurs. If the costs are relatively the same, the renovation may offer better value not available in new construction like extra amenities, architectural stature, quality and maintainability of traditional materials, and other more subjective factors. 
In my experience, renovation often, but not always, represents the better value, and often, too, is more supportive of community values and stability. But in the end, it is a subjective decision to be made by elected school officials and their constituents. I hope this twinned analysis approach outlined here will help communities choose the path that will best meet their educational goals at the best price. Thank you for listening to our podcast today entitled Renovation versus Replacement of Older and Historic Schools. We hope that you take this opportunity to learn from the content presented and add to your professional knowledge on renovation versus replacement of educational facilities. ASEF would like to extend a very special thank you to our presenter, Royce Yader, and to you for listening to our podcast today. We hope you will join us again soon. Please remember to visit our website at www.acefacilities.org to access other learning events and follow us on your preferred social media outlet. Please take a moment to complete the podcast evaluation at acefacilities.org. We value your opinion and look forward to hearing your feedback.